Hello and welcome back to The Independent Pianist. I'm your host, Cole Henderson, as usual. And today we are looking at one of the greatest and also most enigmatic among Liszt's works. Valet Dobreman was not a work that enjoyed much success during Liszt's lifetime. In fact, as the years went by and he became more and more resigned to the negative reaction afforded to his music in the press, he avoided playing works like this altogether and actively discouraged his students from playing them. There's a story that one of his students wanted to play this piece in an important debut concert and Liszt strongly dissuaded him and suggested if he really, really wanted to play it, to only play the first section. So the first section of the piece is maybe five minutes long out of a roughly 15 minute piece. And Liszt just suggested this because he knew rightly that his student would be castigated for including this supposedly bizarre piece, which would have inevitably been characterized as the product of a diseased mind by the leading conservative critics of the day. It was only much later in the 20th century that this piece, among others, finally has begun to take its place in the mainstream repertoire of well-known pianists. Likewise, at Liszt's legendary masterclasses in Weimar, where many of the great young pianists of the day congregated to learn from the master, he had many students who were eager to champion his music and Many of them brought this piece for him to hear, but he never consented to hear it played. He always would choose something else. At last, on one occasion when he was in a particularly relaxed mood, he asked his student Gullerich to play the piece for him. And he was so moved to hear this piece finally uh, that it brought tears to his eyes. The memories that were evoked by it were so powerful and painful for him. This piece undoubtedly represented many of the feelings of loneliness and alienation that Liszt suffered in the late 20s and early 30s immediately after the death of his father, Adam. Like many of Liszt's pieces, this one had a long gestation period. Liszt first published it in 1840, and that was a very different version than what we usually hear now. He revised it over the 1840s and 1850s and finally published the version we know today in 1858. But undoubtedly the germ for this piece goes back, as I said, to the late 1820s and the period immediately after the death of his father. Along with others among his most striking autobiographical pieces, such as what became the Pensée de Mort, for example, with which it shares some themes and moods, as well as this kind of daring experimentalism, which was very typical of the young list. He experimented with many interesting things in notation, including ways of indicating accelerandos and retardandos and rubato. And another aspect of this kind of experimentalism, of course, is his extraordinary harmonic writing, which was unheard of for the day. So ostensibly, this is an E minor piece that doesn't contain a true arrival on an E minor root position chord for almost six minutes. It's an E minor piece that modulates twice, to G minor and B flat minor in the first phrase. Those are not small modulations, those are really striking changes of key that happen immediately at the beginning of the piece. These must have seemed like simply bizarre whims to many of his contemporaries, but this kind of writing is actually justified in the progression of the piece. All these keys become important structural points. For example, B flat, respelled as A sharp, becomes the arrival point for the stormy development-like section, and G minor is a kind of subtle foreshadowing of the C major second theme, since G is the dominant of C. Likewise, Liszt touches on F sharp minor in the opening section, and that also becomes an important arrival point for the second theme in the very end of the piece. So on the one hand, this is a strikingly programmatic work, as many of Liszt's works were. It has many resonances with Liszt's own life. And on the other hand, it's also a powerful intellectual statement of the mature composer. This is one possible answer that Liszt found to the overwhelmingly powerful influence of Beethoven on the musicians of his generation. Particularly, Liszt felt the influence of Beethoven's last works very powerfully. 
he championed the Hammer Clavier Sonata, and I think he kind of tried to wrestle with this legacy that was left to him. Of course, a work like the B minor sonata is a totally different kind of reaction, and an equally powerful one. So the programmatic connection in this case is with the French romantic novel Obermann by Pierre-Étienne de Senancourt. And this novel was written in 1804. It didn't get much attention at the time, but almost two decades later, it was rediscovered by a whole generation of romantics and was glorified by characters like Liszt and others. Obermann is a kind of typical romantic character. He's lonely, solitary kind of figure who has placed himself in self-imposed exile along the Jura Mountains in Switzerland. The valley of the title is not really a physical valley, but instead it represents a state of mind. So Obermann associates life in the valley with ennui, frustration, dissatisfaction, and the futility of existence. By contrast, the life that one experiences on the mountaintop to Obermann is more true, more genuine, raised above the mundane and prosaic to the realm of true inspiration and beauty. The Valley of Obermann then is the embodiment of Obermann's depression and despair as opposed to the possibility and freedom of the mountains. There are other ways in which Obermann is a typically romantic character. He's consumed with uncertainty and self-doubt he doesn't know how to find himself or to bring the potential that he feels within himself to fruition. And this is really embodied in the first of the two quotations from Obermann that Liszt included when he published the piece. So here's the little quotation, and I make my own kind of free translation. So excuse me if you know there's a problem with the translation. It's, it's my own, and I kind of take some liberties. What do I desire? What am I? What do I ask of nature? Every cause is invisible, every end deceitful. All forms change, time slips away. I feel I exist only to consume myself in unconquerable desires, to drink in the seductions of an unreal world, to remain dismayed by its voluptuous delusions. In the second quotation, Obermann speaks of a harrowing sleepless night in which he experiences in concentrated form every possible mental and spiritual torment and exaltation. Incommunicable sensibility, the beauty and torment of our futile years, vast awareness of an all-encompassing nature, overwhelming and everywhere impenetrable, universal ardor, the wisdom of sages, voluptuous abandon, all that a mortal heart can contain of desire and despair, I felt everything, experienced everything in this memorable night. I have taken a sinister step towards the age of decrepitude. I have devoured ten years of my life. For his final quotation, Liszt moves to another classic of romantic literature, Byron's Child Harold's Pilgrimage, with this stanza. Could I embody and unbosom now that which is most within me? Could I wreak my thoughts upon expression and thus throw soul, heart, mind, passions, feelings, strong or weak, all that I would have sought and all I seek, bear, know, feel, and yet breathe into one word? And that one word were lightning, I would speak. But as it is, I live and die unheard, with a most voiceless thought, sheathing it as a sword. For an artist, I feel this is quite extraordinary, as it expresses perfectly the impossibility that we oftentimes feel in reaching full expression of our innermost imagination. The isolation and alienation felt by Senancour's hero must have had a strong resonance for Liszt as well. At the time he was working on the first version of this piece, he was in effect in exile from his adopted home of France due to the irregular nature of his uh, relationship with the Countess Marie d'Agoult, who became the, ch the mother of his children. He was a wanderer in Switzerland, and he remained a wanderer throughout his life. Hungarian born but French naturalized, Liszt spent much of his life either as an itinerant musician or in his later years, shuttling between Budapest 
Weimar and Rome. All this is encapsulated in a striking musical quotation that Liszt uses in this piece from Schubert's famous song Der Wanderer, where the song's protagonist asks, Always my sighs ask where. So where is his homeland? This must have had a powerful resonance for Liszt, who was so often without a real home. This musical quotation is so clear that it seems likely that the entire piece probably grew from the germ of this one quotation. And incidentally, Liszt did transcribe this song beautifully for piano solo at around the same time he was working on the first version of this piece. I've made a video of it actually some time back if you're curious, and you can clearly see how similarly Liszt composes out the texture of the accompaniment in this passage to sound very similar to the same passage in Valle Dobermann. Another possible musical source for the opening is the beginning of Weber's great sonata in E minor, Op. 70, which Liszt would have been intimately acquainted with. He even edited an edition of Weber's sonatas at one point. And even though this piece never found critical success during Liszt's lifetime, you can clearly see that it deeply affected at least one of Liszt's younger colleagues. Peter Tchaikovsky lifted the opening phrase note for note to create his famous aria for Lenski in Eugene Onegin. Uh, Tchaikovsky just changes one pitch, adds an accidental to one note, the A, becomes an A sharp. And it's a very effective change, actually, that somehow is very undeniably Russian sounding. At any rate, as a programmatic piece, this piece clearly follows the program. There are four main sections, and the first obviously epitomizes the despair of Obermann's metaphysical valley. The second section offers an image of the spiritual exaltation and unconquerable desires of the artist seeking for self-expression. The third section takes us through Obermann's sinister night during which he made such a harrowing advance towards the grave. In the final section of the piece, the sublimation of the artist's desires seems to be fully reached, but the final bars leave us with the realization that all these accomplishments are illusory. At the same time, from an intellectual standpoint, there's the clear suggestion of a classical sonata form outline hidden under this programmatic plan. There's a first theme in E minor, the radiant second theme in C major, a development-like section, and a recapitulation. Although in this case, we only hear the second theme truly recapitulated. And in fact, in the earlier version of this piece, this likeness to sonata form was even more clear. Uh, Liszt included a complete recap of the first theme as well. Many of Liszt's earlier works had this more kind of classical symmetry and clarity to them, which in his later revisions he would kind of alter slightly in a very effective way. So this has a very unique re-envisioning of sonata form, again very different from his own sonata in B minor. It has a striving after spiritual meaning as well as a striking economy of motivic material. In these ways, this piece strongly resembles late Beethoven. I think it's extraordinary that no one at the time seems to have realized how this piece represented an acknowledgement of this great uh, presence and also a throwing off of the influence of the great classical master. So as I said, it's very concentrated motivically. There's only three m main motives and they're found in the first two bars. 
the so-called second theme is actually only a transformation of the first theme. And even though this piece is becoming much more popular, it seems to me that many performances will miss the point of this very sublime music. Uh, I won't name names, but there are a couple of versions out there that take the awkwardness of this piece as an excuse to indulge in some very clever rewriting. And this should make sense, right? I mean, Liszt himself was a very free performer. He would oftentimes include improvisations or, you know, make alterations in other composers' works. And there are many passages in this piece which seem to induce struggle for the pianist, which are very difficult, almost unpianistic, which is very atypical for Liszt. And these rewritten versions do play themselves in a much more pianistic and smooth manner. But unfortunately, from my perspective, they completely miss out on this sense of struggle, of striving, that is so important to the meaning of the piece, just as it is in late Beethoven. So for instance, the idea of repeated chords, which is too lacking in conventional brilliance for some pianists, uh, these repeated chords are a large part of the emotional effectiveness of the piece. They start as a kind of lugubrious, earth-dragging accompaniment to the main theme, but by the end of the piece, they have completely transformed into a kind of trembling, ecstatic accompaniment to the second theme, the vision of fulfillment. And the very struggle inherent in playing these chords is where much of their power comes from. And I found that even in performances which do not engage in any rewriting, there's oftentimes an attempt on the pianist's part to minimize the sense of struggle by slightly fudging or under-emphasizing the faster chords at the end. And this is done by simply misinterpreting Liszt's marking of sempre animando sin al fine, which comes at the beginning of the last section. And this is turned into an accelerando molto, making a huge acceleration in the tempo that can't possibly be maintained. So we get a kind of speeding up and slowing down effect, which loses a lot of the nobility and grandeur of this vision of spiritual mountaintops. I think many pianists get a little bit too caught up in the kind of excitement and bravado of this music and lose this spiritual dimension. I feel that this is definitely a piece that fits Arthur Schnabel's famous dictum. You know, Schnabel had expressed in later years a wish to never play anything except music that he felt was better than it could be played. And I feel that this piece definitely lives up to that it's a never-ending journey to realize its full potential, and I've never found myself entirely satisfied with my own performances of this piece, including this recording. I've come as close as I possibly can, but I know that I'll keep coming back to this piece throughout my life and finding new dimensions to it. But at the same time, that makes it a very exciting and meaningful piece. Every time I come back, it's memorable and difficult and the piece seems to change and grow in its emotional significance. This piece never entirely left a list either. I mean, after working on it for at least 20 years to reach its final version, he again engaged with it some uh, couple decades later when his student Edward Lassen made an arrangement for piano trio, which Liszt subsequently pretty heavily revised, so that it basically ends up being Liszt's own arrangement. I highly recommend that you listen to a good performance of this version, if you're, particularly if you're trying to play this piece, because so many things that are mysterious about the interpretation become much clearer when you hear the approach that string players naturally take towards these ideas. They just have a much more straightforward and direct way of approaching this music, which is actually exactly what it needs from the pianist as well when you're playing the solo version. In some ways, I almost like that arrangement even more than the original. Also, this version demonstrates that Liszt probably ended up preferring the seldom heard uh, alternative passage in the final section. You know, there's a part where he puts an alternative in small type above the main text. And actually, he ended up using that in the piano trio arrangement. So I use this Ossia passage here also, since I just kind of like it better. And you almost never hear anyone use it. It's really interesting and it also creates a, a structural uh, correspondence so that the later part of this section actually is a amplified repeat of this Ossia passage. So please enjoy the complete performance of the work and of course consider supporting this channel 
you can do that easily if you want to become a continual supporter of the channel you can do that easily through patreon.com www.patreon.com forward slash independent pianist and thank you to all my supporters through patreon you're really helping me to continue bringing you this content um, every little bit helps even if you're just contributing five dollars or three dollars a month or or whatever if you want to just make a one-time donation you can do that easily through paypal um, I recently discovered that some people outside of the US might be being charged a fee though to use PayPal so I also signed up for Revolut so you can also find a link for that in the description box that's better if you're in Europe or somewhere else outside of the United States so anyway thank you again for watching and I'll see you next week for some more great music until then take care <laughs>